A radical look at Scottish history. Part 16. More on the Stuarts. I've already made reference to the fact that most of the Stuart monarchs spoke Scots, like the rest of the population, outside of the islands and islands in their time. And some of them also had the Gaelic. Now, most royal dynasties tended to speak differently from those they saw as peasants, serfs, or even slaves. The language of the English court, due to its Norman French inheritance, was for a long time French. Later, for a while in the 17th and 18th century, it was German. And some royal dynasties kept this up remarkably late, the language of the Russian court remaining French till almost the very end. However, it was different here, and in 1498, the Spanish envoy Pedro de Ayala wrote home about James IV, and it is quite a remarkable pen portrait. The king is 25 years and some months old. He's of noble stature, neither tall nor short, and as handsome in complexion and shape as a man can be. His address is very agreeable. He speaks the following foreign languages. Latin, very well. French, German, Flemish, Italian and Spanish. Spanish as well as the Marquis, but he pronounces it more distinctly. He likes very much to receive Spanish letters. His own Scots language is as different from English as Aragonese from Castilian. The king speaks besides the language of the savages who live in some parts of Scotland and on the islands. It is as different from Scots as Biscayan is from Castilian. His knowledge of languages is wonderful. He is well read in the Bible and in some other devout books. He is a good historian. He has read many Latin and French histories and profited by them as he has a very good memory. De Yala was, of course, an aristocrat himself, and his reference to the Geltacht is telling. His people are savages, sadly an attitude that remained common amongst the English, and particularly, sadly, too many Scots till the 18th century, the legacy of which is an ongoing problem. James was also known as a patron of the arts, encouraging the Scots makers or poets. Henderson, Dunbar, Douglas and Kennedy, who were all at his court at various times. He was also very fond of education and passed an act in 1496 requiring all substantial landowners to ensure that their sons received some education. No mention of the daughters, though. He also had a strong interest in matters scientific, and although alchemy nowadays is seen as little more than mumbo-jumbo, his patronage of that topic was cutting edge for the time. However, as King of Scots, there was no chance of him having a peaceful life, and as well as the ongoing struggles to try and control the islands and islands, there was the perennial problem of English attempts at subjugating Scotland. Amongst his other attributes, James seems to have been a courageous man and was noted for putting himself in danger in battle. It appears that he thought it advisable to lead by example and while this is not necessarily a good thing for a king, it does have something of the aspect of a clan chief to it. As it happened, James did die in the middle of battle, in what was probably Scotland's worst ever defeat at the hands of the English, the Battle of Flodden. This was fought on the 9th of September 1513, and despite some wild estimates of Scottish casualties, there is no doubt that they ran into the thousands, and the loss was felt in many parts of the country. The Great Borders Anthem, The Floors of the Forest, sums up what was probably the prevailing mood in Scotland after the battle. We'll hae near middle at the yow milkin. Women and bairns are dewy and wee, sighing and moaning on ilka green loanin. The floors of the forest are all weed away. So yet again, Scotland had an infant king, James V being crowned in October that year at the age of 17 months. This, of course, led to the usual disruption, plotting and counterplotting that sort of bedeviled medieval Scotland. Much of James V's education came from Sir William Lindsay, a noted poet or marker in his own right, and we know that some of the stories and poems that the young king was fond of were rooted in ancient Scottish culture, some of it provably from pre-Christian times. As well as being a patron of the arts, he was himself a musician and a poet. One poem attributed to him is striking, and how it may have related to some of the stories told of the king himself. This is known as the Gaberlunzi Man, or the Jolly Beggar. Gaberlunzis, 
also known as blue goons from their cloaks, were officially licensed beggars. And there is a tradition that James himself went about as a gabalunzi amongst his subjects from time to time. There's another story that emphasises his supposed interest in the people of his kingdom. These stories survive within the communities that tell them because they mean something to that community, and they survive because they continue to have relevance. This can often be because one story makes a particular point about a permanent aspect of human nature, or another shows up the humorous aspect of such behaviour. But they must all strike a chord, both with the audience and the teller. And this was, of course, of considerably more significance before the development of widespread literacy and later print and electronic media. Stories were how children learned about the world and it was through word of mouth that people heard about what was happening elsewhere in their country and their world. And there's a group of stories from across Scotland that are of considerable relevance to how James V and maybe even other of the Stuart kings were seen by the people. It's a simple fact that these stories belong where they are told and become part of communal cultural inheritance. If the same story survives in different places, this is because it has as much relevance for the community in each place as another. And this particular story has the king wandering the land dressed like a commoner. In some versions, there's a pack of armed retainers not far off in case he gets into trouble. Not at all. In all the different versions, the king is attacked by robbers and a local man comes to his assistance. Both were, of course, armed and due to their courage and skill with the sword, they see off their assailants. In some versions, the king then tells the local manny to come to the court at Stirling and ask for the good man of Balangich, because he works at the court and there he will be given a reward. This he does only to discover that the man whose life he had helped save the good man of Balangich was no other than the king. The story is told of a man called Kuti near Dundee, Jock Howison at Cramon, and John Buchanan at Kippen known as the King of Kippen, were all said to have been given lands by the king for their help. There are other versions of the story, and the fact that it was told in so many different locations underlines that this was a popular tale that had taken root in a range of different communities. As such, it gives a picture of a monarch that is effectively seeing the king as being one of his people, of them. This, I suggest, strongly echoes the sentiments of the Declaration of Arbroath and the reality of clan society where the chief was of his people and not separate and over them. It is also maybe something that we can see in the problems that James's daughter Mary went on to have with John Knox, who pushed the notion that the rulers can rule without the consent of the rule, something again that is hinted at in the Declaration of our Rule. Like so many earlier, Kings of Scots, James was keen to preserve the advantage that he had in the old alliance, and in 1537 he married Madeleine de Valois, sister of the French King Francis. Sadly, she died soon after, and the following year he married Mary de Guise, daughter of one of France's leading noblemen, and a woman who used to play her own part in Scottish history. Unlike so many of his predecessors, James V did die in his bed. It was just days after his successor Mary was born, two earlier sons not having survived infancy. As he lay on his deathbed in Falkland Palace, when he heard of the birth of his daughter, James is reported as saying, It can we alas, it will gang we alas. This purportedly refers to the Stuarts having come to the throne through the descent from Robert I's daughter Marjorie, and that Mary would be the end of the line. As it turns out, she wasn't. But her son, James the Sixth, was the Stuart who turned his back on Scotland. Next time, Mary and the European Dimension.